It's almost Christmas time. Well, for me anyway, for you Christmas is done and gone, but for me at the time of this recording, it's almost Christmas time, and that means time to make a gift. This year the gift I'm going to be making is for my grandma, and she has requested that I make her a dresser. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make her a coffee table. The design I'm going to be using for the top and bottom shelf of that coffee table is going to be like you see here in this little piece I've been using for experimentation. Two contrasting species of wood meeting together in this sort of waving shape here. The inspiration for this design came from the Fisher Shop YouTube channel. I'll provide a link up here to that video. I'm not going to be doing the exact same thing he did. I'm going to be simplifying the outcome a little bit and adding an extra step to the process to complicate it because that's what I like to do. But this is the gist of the design. And this is the wood I'm going to be using for this project. African mahogany, bird's eye maple, and this massive chunk of hard maple for the legs. Now let's get started by cutting this to rough length and milling them down. I glued up the four narrow strips of bird's eye maple into two wide strips to match the width of the two panels of mahogany I was working with. Fortunately, I don't have quite enough pipe clamps to deal with this, so I had to tackle these glue ups one at a time. Now to begin work on the wavy design, which starts with a plywood template cut on the bandsaw. The shape is nothing special, it's just a drunken straight line running the length of the template. I need to cut through both contrasting species of wood at the same time, so I stuck them together with some carpet tape, which actually turned out to be a mistake. Carpet tape is rather permanent and very difficult to get off wood. Then I can trace a line from one side of the template and take the stacked slab over to the bandsaw to make the rough cut, following the line as closely as I could muster, which was not very. With the rough cut made, I can then stick the plywood templates to the work pieces, again using carpet tape, and refine the shape of the curve over at the router table using a flush trim bit. Annoyingly, I had to use two different flush trim bits for every single board to avoid routing uphill against the grain. I started out with the template on top using the top bearing flush trim bit, and then flipped the board over to orient the grain in the other direction, and swapped out the bit for a bottom bearing bit. In making these two slabs, I had to swap out the router bit 16 times. Even with all this work, I still had a minor incident. <laughs> with the curve finishing done, I could unstick the templates from the work pieces. And again, this is not a good task for carpet tape. Carpet tape is too permanent. I had to spend a good hour with the acetone and elbow grease scraping the tape off of these boards. And even then, it left sticky residue. Then I could glue up the opposing curves one section at a time. To minimize the gaps in the curves as much as possible, I just clamp the snot out of them. After the first section had dried for a sufficient amount of time, I could then glue up the second section. Those two curvy glue ups make the bottom shelf of the coffee table. For the top, I made a new plywood template and did everything all over again. Having learned nothing from last time, I used carpet tape again, but this time I used a different brand of carpet tape, and I don't think it's going to need acetone this time. Peels right off! I'll link to this brand of carpet tape in the video description. These four sections are now glued up and ready to be flattened and planed, but I can't flatten them by just sending them through the planer. These boards, each one of them has a little bit of twisting and some of them have a little bit of bowing to them, so I need to send them through the planer on a jointing jig, which is just a fancy name for this board. Now normally you would put your workpiece on this known flat board and then shim up the high spots so the rollers of the planer can't flatten it down and you get flattening through the planer. But shims are a little bit annoying to set up and the workpiece will slide around on this board. So instead I'm going to use hot glue. Just put several puddles of hot glue down on this board, stick the workpiece to it, and it'll create sort of self-leveling shims and it will temporarily adhere the workpiece to this board.
All right, the hot glue shimming technique worked beautifully. At least it seemed to. So assuming I can get this board off the jig cleanly, there we go. I'm going to do that with the three remaining boards and in the future, because that was very simple and very work worky. It worky very well. -y. With one side flattened, I could then ditch the jointing jig, playing the opposite side of all four boards, and get them to a uniform thickness. This is looking really good. It's not perfect. It's not ready for glue up yet. First, I need to throw this through the table saw to get rid of this imperfection, and then throw some biscuits at it for alignment purposes and glue them up. This is the top, and this is the bottom shelf. I chose this as the top just because the figure of the maple is more pronounced than on the bottom one there. Then after the glue dried on those two slabs, I sanded them. And sanded them some more. And sanded them some more. I spent literally hours sanding these two slabs. I sanded the undersides of the slabs to 120 grit, and I sanded the top sides to 220 grit. Then I wet down the surface to raise the grain, let the water dry, and re-sanded them with 220 grit sandpaper for a glass smooth surface. And here's the nearly finished product. I think these slabs look beautiful, but I have to be honest, they're not without defects. However, as I already said, I'm making this table as a gift. And what kind of manners would I have if I divulged the defects of something that I made as a gift? This little crack right here is far and away the biggest defect between the two slabs. What happened here is I routed ever so slightly uphill on the maple, and the router bit grabbed a hold and took a chunk out of it. This gap is much bigger on the underside of this slab, but that's why it's on the underside. This piece is going to be on the bottom of the coffee table, so I'm not incredibly worried about it, but it is something to point out. Now, I did fill it in with CA glue, but all that really accomplished was filling in the crack with something. It didn't do anything to hide it. Here and here are two places where I got a little too aggressive peeling up the wood glue, and the wood glue pulled away a little bit of wood with it, leaving a couple of divots. So I filled those in with CA glue, and then sanded them flush with the surface, and because this is bird's eye maple, they blend in pretty seamlessly. They just look like parts of the wood rather than defects that I tried to fill in with some cyanoacrylate. If I didn't tell you those were defects, you probably wouldn't be able to notice them. The top slab turned out almost completely defect free. I'd like to say it's because I was more careful, but really it was just blind luck. I did use the CA glue trick to fill in a couple of voids on this top slab, but I'm not going to tell you where they are because I don't actually know where they were. I know there were like five of them, but I can't even spot them now, so I guess that means it worked. I wanted this piece to be on the top because this strip of maple is the most figured out of all the pieces of wood I got, so it's nice that it turned out defect free because it's lovely looking. Now let's make some legs, which I'm going to make out of that massive chunk of hard maple that I showed you earlier in the video and these two scraps of mahogany. Wait, wait, first I need to trim these two to the final size. I forgot about that step. Getting ahead of myself. After the leg bits were rough sawn at the bandsaw, I could plane them smooth and to a uniform thickness at the planer, and then glue up all four legs in one go. After the glue dried, I could clean off the excess mahogany and glue squeezings at the table saw, send all four legs through the planer again, and trim off the ends at the miter saw.
This is what designing on the fly looks like. I don't need no stinking computer sketches. I've just got everything blocked and clamped up in place so I can visualize it and go from there. I've got the slabs blocked up to the height that I want. So that, I think it's about 20 inches and I've got two of the legs clamped on so I can get the angle visualized and that's the angle I'm going with. I've set the angle on this bevel gauge here and I'm ready to make some cuts. <laughs> The next thing to do is to cut a dado into each one of these legs at the bottom to accept the bottom shelf of the coffee table. And since the bottom and top shelf of the coffee table are slightly different thicknesses, I've set up my dado stack here near as I can get it to the exact thickness of this bottom shelf. Now to throw this into the radial arm saw and make the cuts into the legs. I'm guessing because this maple is especially hard and I'm cutting it with the dado blade, I had a rather difficult time with the radial arm saw cutting these dados. Nonetheless, I persevered and made it through all four dado cuts. Well, I have decided that the radial arm saw is the worst tool ever invented, but it did make all of these cuts without destroying anything. Except for this tooth on my dado stack, which has been ripped out of existence. Believe it or not, I am actually going to make the second set of dados up here with the radial arm saw again. I'm just going to try a different technique. Now I need to set up my dado stack again with the different thickness of the top shelf of the coffee table. For the second set of dados, I just fed the saw in backwards to keep it from self-feeding like it was doing before. While much safer, this had the unfortunate downside of redirecting the flow of sawdust onto me. And what resulted from all that radial arm saw trauma? I screwed up! I put all the grooves on the same side of the legs. While this is a unique look, not at all what I was going for. And this is especially troublesome because today, at the time of this recording, it is Christmas Day. Okay, I've had several hours to think about what I'm going to do to fix my mistake here. And what I've decided is I'm going to embrace it. I can't make two more legs because I'm out of mahogany and it's Christmas Day. So everything's closed and I can't get more mahogany. This is how the legs were supposed to look. Sitting on the outside of the shelves with dados cut into legs for the shelves to sit in but I screwed up two of the legs and here's one of them. I've just chopped the dado sections out of this leg so it's three separate pieces and this is going to be the new design of the table. I'm just going to glue them in place like that so it looks like the legs are going through the slabs. Obviously they're not, they're just sitting there, but it's going to look like that. Now this glue joint on its own would be very weak. It's just a side grain to end grain glue joint and that wouldn't hold up over time. So I'm going to reinforce these joints with dowels, quarter inch dowels because that's all I have and I can't get anything else. But before I do anything with the legs and finish this tabletop, I need to take these slabs off and finish them up. I need to add a chamfer to all the edges, cut the corners off, sand the edges, etc., etc., and then we can work on the legs and gluing them up with complicated dowel joints. It's not that complicated. I don't know why I said complicated. Now to attach the legs, I'm going to start with the bottom shelf in the middle leg assemblies. I've glued up these quick spacer blocks here to get them in the same spot on each corner. Smear just a wheezy bit of glue on the bottom of them. Hold it in place, making sure to get the spacing just right. Drive in two pin nails from underneath to hold everything in place, just temporarily. Then follow up the pin nails by drilling a small pilot hole. Pilot hole and drive in a small screw to act as a clamp for that little bit of glue to dry before I can move on to the next step. And I can do that on all four corners. Well, that's that part done. Now I can do the same thing from up top with different spacer blocks. And now I can drive in dowels for extra reinforcement.
The glue has dried on my middle bits here, and it's no longer Christmas Day, so I was able to go out and buy proper half-inch dowel pieces. So I'm going to use those to install these top caps and the little bottom leg pieces. But I can't install those like I did with the middle bits by installing them, gluing them into place, and then driving in the dowels later, because that would make the dowels visible on the outside. And I don't want that cluttering up the visual appearance of my lovely wavy table here. So I've made these two little quick templates to help me out. All I need to do is align the piece mostly visually, but also with the help of my edge guide template here. Then hold this piece in place and put this template around it that is the same size as the leg sections. Clamp the template in place with a little spring clamp there. Remove the leg section and replace it with this little dowel drilling guide. I can't use this as an actual guide, it's just to guide my brad point bit and hit it with a hammer to mark the spot. And this block is also the same size as my leg piece, so I can flip it over and do the same thing on my little leg piece to mark exactly where the holes need to go for the dowels. Then I just need to drill the holes in both of these places. And I can do a dry fit to make sure everything fits all right. Now I can apply glue to it and make it permanent. That was perhaps way too much glue, but that's okay. I can wipe it off. And here it is, in its done state, which is also what I would call a country named after me. To finish it, I applied three wipe-on coats of this, which is just a half and half mixture of oil-based polyurethane and mineral spirits. And that finish wasn't very smooth, so I hand sanded the touchy surfaces with 320 grit sandpaper, and then finished it off with a final very thin skim coat of this stuff to leave a nice glossy smooth, if not satin, finish. And I'm happy with how this thing turned out. Now, I'm not a designer, and at least part of this design was mistake-driven, but considering those two things, I love the way this table turned out. The contrast of the bird's eye maple to the mahogany looks lovely. I love the way the two different species of wood interact in a non-linear fashion. I'm super happy that I added these strips of mahogany to accent the hard maple legs, because without them it might have looked a little plain. And the bird's eye maple itself looks lovely. On the bottom, there's lots of little bird's eyes, and it's a lovely looking piece of wood. And again, it interacts with the mahogany in a non-linear fashion, which I'm pretty proud of. It adds a little more interest to the piece. But on the top, this piece is amazing. It's got lots of bird's eye in going on, but it's also a highly figured, lovely piece of bird's eye maple. And that's why it's on the top, facing the everyone. Now, will my grandma like this table? I don't know. Will it fit in with her living room? I don't know. Again, I'm not a designer. My wife tells me that this is mid-century modern, which is weird because I thought it was a table. I don't think it'll stand out in the living room, but I think it'll look fine. I'm happy with how it turned out, and I had a lot of fun making this table, even if it was just a tiny bit rushed. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you like this video and the finished product. Subscribe? Is that what YouTubers say?